Okay, this is David Zeeler, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It's Wednesday, August 3rd, 2022. I'm very happy to be here with Dr. Jean Hardebeck. Jean, it's very nice to be with you. Thank you so much for joining me. Sure, it's my pleasure. Thanks. Jean, to start, would you please tell me your title and institutional affiliation? Um, so I'm a research geophysicist at the U.S. Geological Survey, located in Moffett Field, California. Now, the designation geophysics or a geophysicist, are there seismologists with that title at the survey, or that's sort of the umbrella term under which seismologists work? Yeah, that's the um, umbrella term under which seismologists work. I don't think there's anybody who's officially a research seismologist. I think we're we're all called research geophysicists, along with people who do other sorts of geophysical work. Now, as this academic specialty, would seismologists be the best way to describe what you work on? Yeah, yeah, seismology. Just as a snapshot in time, what are you currently working on? Um, so I'm currently working on aftershock forecasting. So the the USGS has a fairly new product that we put out after magnitude five and greater earthquakes in the U.S. That we put out a forecast of how many aftershocks we're expecting. Um, what's the probability of of a large aftershock that might be you know might be felt or might be damaging? <clears throat> so I'm working. Um, sort of on some applied science in, in terms of getting that done and also some more basic research and trying to understand um, the triggering of aftershocks by main shocks. Gene, for you personally and institutionally at the survey, what are what are the feelings about the prospects of earthquake prediction? <laughs> um, so um, we mostly don't even say that word. Um, I think you know the focus. The focus is really more on probabilistic forecasting rather than sort of a deterministic. An earthquake of this size will happen here at this time. More trying to say, um, you know, this is a probability of an earthquake of a in a certain size range in a certain area over a certain time frame, and that's everything from the aftershock forecasts that my group is putting out are, are framed like that. It's just the probability of aftershocks of various sizes. Um, so, uh, you know, for the very short term aftershock forecasts through to uh, the USGS puts out these national seismic hazard maps, which are basically the probability of shaking at various levels over, you know, a, a 30 or 50 year period. So that's that's really what we're what we're fo- kind of focused on operationally. And it's also, I think, how the scientists feel that it's not really it's not really our goal at the moment to try to be predicting earthquakes. We're taking kind of a longer, more circuitous route towards towards something like that by understanding, trying to understand better the physics of what's happening to try to get a better, better handle on um, if we can say things about the probabilities of earthquakes uh, and, you know, to understand better when an earthquake happens, what the probability of various levels of ground motion that then we can communicate with engineers who are worried about, you know, building buildings and bridges and whatnot. Gene, as I've come to appreciate, there's two ways of looking at the problem. As you say, you know, determinism is so far off at this point in terms of being able to accurately predict. To what extent is that about we're simply not there yet in terms of the technology, the tools that we would need? And to what extent is it about it's just not possible because earthquakes are fundamentally unpredictable? Yeah, so my my feeling is yeah, you know, my personal feeling on this is that um, wh- whether or not an earthquake happens in a specific location, a specific time, is going to be highly controlled by the the state of the earth at that location, that little bit of the fault, um, how much stress is on it, what kind of, you know, are there fluids there, what pressure are those fluids at, you know, have there been earthquakes nearby in the past that have loaded this up, um, you know, is there a little crack there because, you know, a hundred thousand years ago, this was part of some, you know, so, and I think you kind of would have to have that level of information about, you know, every location in the earth at these depths that, you know, we, we mostly can't, can't get to at all, right? Like there's a, a few very deep boreholes for, for study, but we would have to have kind of that level of information 
everywhere, I think, to be able to really deterministically say, okay, now this part of this fault is ready to fail and it's likely to trigger further failure on this fault and produce an earthquake of that size. So my my feeling is that that probably just the, the detail of information you need to do something deterministic is probably outside of, of what we realistically are, are going to be able to do. Um, and, and do ever or do like in the foreseeable future? Are these are those not meaningful distinctions as far as you're concerned? I, I, I think in the foreseeable future, like I can't I can't foresee that we would really have the technology to scan the earth with the level of, of detail that that we would need and know the history of it to the level of detail that we need. Um, but, you know, that said, we are being able to image this stuff in better and better detail as the data improves, as data processing improves, as computational speeds improve. So, I, th you know, I think we're, we're ending this understanding this stuff a lot better. But and I think that can that can help us kind of narrow down these probabilistic statements that we make. But yeah, I I certainly I I, I certainly doesn't seem in the foreseeable future to me that we're going to be able to do any sort of real deterministic prediction. Gene, some overall questions on your focus on aftershocks. First, a little bit of a history of the subfield. How far back does this particular line of inquiry go? Um. Oh gosh! So I mean, it goes over. It it goes more than a hundred years into the past. Um, so there's this um, concept of of Omori decay of aftershocks, and uh, I I can't remember the years of this, but Omori was a, a Japanese scientist working on a um, earthquake sequence in Japan that's I, I think in like like the 1890s or something, and you know, was started to to be able to see what, um, you know, at first you have a lot of aftershocks and then the rate of aftershocks decreases with time. And he started to be able to see that. And you can go back now and look at that place in Japan and see that aftershock still going on and the and the aftershock sequence still going on, those rate of aftershocks still decaying. So people, people have certainly been thinking about aftershocks and trying to understand um, aftershocks for, you know, a, over, you know, over a hundred years, which is kind of a long time in seismology, right? I mean, if you think about it, you know, Richter's working like in the thirties and, and stuff. So, so, um, yeah, this, this really goes back to, to kind of the, the beginnings of, of seismology. Um, and aftershocks are kind of your more, your most predictable earthquakes, right? If you're looking for predictability, you know, you have a main shock, you know, what's going to happen is you're going to have aftershocks. So, so I think it's, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's certainly something that people have been interested in for a long time, but it's still, you know, there's theories about what triggers aftershocks, and they're mostly around changes in stress from the main shock. Um, but, you know, there's those theories, you know, look like they're probably a good kind of first order explanation as to what's happening, but they're not, um, you know, they're obviously not fully developed, and they're not able to take into account yet a lot of this information about sure you have a stress change from the main shock but that's superimposed on what are these faults ready to fail then maybe you'll trigger a lot of aftershocks if these faults aren't ready to fail um maybe you don't and kind of that that understanding um of how the, all those things interact i think is 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 something that that you know we're still working on and still needs a lot of work gene for a field of inquiry that's a century old what are some of the modern technological advances that make this a vibrant field today that allow you to do new science that wasn't possible before? Um, you know, so I, d digital recordings, I think, are one of the, the key things that, you know, starting at least in California in the, in the 80s, we have, you know, really good digital records. Um, so we have a lot more information about aftershocks. Um, and then sort of maybe around in the 90s or 2000s, people started keeping continuous data. Up to that point, uh, you know, the, all the data is coming in and they just snip out, oh, here's an earthquake, we'll snip it out and we'll save this and we'll kind of just throw away all this junk in between. Um, but but then starting in, in sort of the 90s and 2000s, people are like, okay, we have enough, you know, computer technology has improved to the point where we can just save all of this stuff. And so now there are techniques where you can run through all of this data and by you know 
um, matching, like you, if you if you have some earthquake signals and you can kind of run through just to correlate with everything, and you can kind of find these find these small earthquakes kind of hidden in the noise because you can kind of match them with the template of these other earthquakes. And so you can pull out tons more aftershocks than you used to be able to. Um, that even, you know, when I was at Caltech in the 90s, we, we had just those aftershocks that some analysts had picked out for us to look at. But now people, you know, run these codes and um, you can find 10 times as many aftershocks when you, when you run these codes as you do just with the kind of initial um, uh, network analysts looking, looking for aftershocks. So now we have, you know, we have an order of magnitude or more aftershocks to look at now than we did in the past. And so, so yeah, we just have, we just have really tons more information now. Um, Jean, you mentioned theory. What have been some advances in the theoretical world that provide guidance to, to the data? Um, so I, I think sort of the biggest, um, the biggest steps in theory have really been looking at um, how stress changes might work. Um, particularly there's kind of two kinds of stress changes, what we call static stress change, which is the earthquake happens, it shifts everything, there's a change in stress and that's kind of baked in. And there's also dynamic stresses of as the seismic waves come through and they shake everything, you know, there's those sort of short term stresses as everything is getting shook can also, can also trigger earthquakes. So there's been a lot of developments in kind of understanding how both of those, a lot of theoretical developments in understanding how both of those work, particularly the static um, stress triggering. And there's also been um, a really important thing uh, that actually came out of USGS is uh, this idea of, of rate and state friction on faults. And that if you have a fault, the, you know, the friction is the force holding it together, right? And, and it depends on kind of how fast things are moving. And it also depends on the history of that fault. And this is something from lab work that's been developed, um, what that how that friction works and that's been combined then with theoretically how the static stress changes and dynamic stress changes work to get a theory of um, when a stress is applied to a fault system how many you know how many earthquakes are you, are you expecting what's the timing of those earthquakes you're, you're expecting and that's actually that's turning out to be um, you know pretty powerful uh, combination of those kind of two two bits of two bits of work, kind of this theory and this lab work um, that's actually one of the best models and one of the most sophisticated models we have currently of, of kind of when and where aftershocks are going to occur after a main shock. Jean, an overall question, a counterfactual question in light of your decision to pursue a career at the USGS as a federal employee. So if we can imagine a, a, a scale where on one end is a professor with more or less total intellectual freedom <clears throat> to pursue the kind of research that they want to do. And on the other, a, a federal employee, a bureaucratic functionary, if you will, <laughs> whose entire work is defined by the agency, by the taxpayer dollar. Where, where are you on that scale in terms of the kind of research you want to do, the kind of research you're able to do? Um, I, you know, I feel like I have... I probably have as much academic freedom as a professor does because, you know, a professor to do their work, writes a proposal, sends it to NSF or whatever, they get a yes or a no, they fund it or not. And I basically go through the same process internally at USGS every year. I write a proposal and say, this is what I want to do this year. This is how it's going to help us understand earthquakes. It's going to have, how this is going to help us, um, you know, try to work towards redu reducing um, uh, earthquake risk, risk in the U.S. and I get told yes or no, I can do that. And so kind of my parameters I'm working in is I need to, you know, I need to justify to the higher ups in the USGS and of course then have to eventually adjust, justify that to the taxpayers why the work I'm doing, um, you know, why the work I'm doing is actually going to be helpful to mitigating earthquake hazards someday and it doesn't have to be immediate it isn't you know it's not like this year it's going to but this is part of this research that we need to do to get to the point where we can um you know where we can do something to, to mitigate earthquake hazard so you know so as long as i i work kind of in that in that framework i, I you know if, if one day i decide 
I'm suddenly really interested in the inner core and I have no way of relating that to earthquake hazards, then they're probably going to say no. But as long as I'm kind of working within this, this framework of earthquake hazards, they've never tell, told me, no, don't work on that. So essentially, in an alternate life, had you pursued an academic path, it's totally conceivable that you'd be doing more or less exactly what you're doing right now. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think it's possible. I, I, you know, I really, I, I mean, part of how I ended up at USGS, of course, is because studying seismology, I've always been very interested in, um, you know, not, not just kind of the science of why this is happening, but um, the, the real world implications of it. So, you know, so I don't think as a professor, I would have one day decided to work on the inner core, but I guess that's possible. And, and I could have, and I know that, um, you know, I know that my friends who are faculty members, sometimes it seems like their, their interests are, are driven sometimes by the students as well. And so, you know, I, I don't know what students I would have interacted with and what they would have been interested. So interested in, so it's, you know, it's possible I could have gone in another direction, but, you know, I feel like I, you know, at the survey, I'm, I'm working on this stuff I want to work on and it's both interesting and, you know, hopefully someday, <laughs> Um, <laughs> actually contributes to, to making us safer from earthquake. Now, in terms of the funding structure and process, to the extent that there's always some element of drama for professors, will they get funded? Will they not get funded? Do you have that uncertainty as well? I, I think I think not as much. Um, so, I mean, the... the the professors always have their salary, or at least they always have their nine months of salary. And what they're they're kind of concerned about is, are they going to be able to fund students, postdocs? Are they going to, you know, have have money for a lab if they need a lab or whatever? And we have those same kind of questions here. Um, you know, we don't have students, but we do have postdocs, and you know, we do have to go through a process to get funding for those postdocs, and you know, if we have big operational expenses, we do have a process to go through to get to get funded. Um, it, I think it, it feels maybe a little bit more stable than the situation of, of a faculty member of having to, to, you know, having all your hopes hanging on whether some proposal gets, gets funded this year. I think it, it, things are maybe a little bit more stable, that there's a little under, more understanding of, you know, the importance of having some number of postdocs at any one time and, the importance of kind of sustained funding for for various projects. So, um, yeah. So, so I mean, we have, you know, we have some of the same problems, but I think less of maybe the kind of the drama, the ups and downs. Gene, what about teaching and mentorship? If you wanted to, do you have opportunity to teach undergraduates, take on graduate students, things like that? Um, yeah, people people here do do that. It's usually done. Um, by becoming an adjunct faculty at at, uh, at a university, um, and so so that's if you want students. There's there's uh, a lot of uh, mentorship opportunities for postdocs, and that's what I've mainly done is 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 uh, mentor postdocs at USGS. Jean, you mentioned or you you indicate that there's sort of future hopes in in aftershocks and an earthquake hazard. What what are the timescales that you're working with? What's that? goal end date where we'll have this and what exactly does that look like? Oh gosh. So I don't think there's like kind of one big goal with a big end date. I think, I think it's more of a process of, you know, we have, we have what we currently do in terms of telling people what to expect in terms of aftershocks. And I, you know, I think it's more of a, you know, how can we improve what people are telling us? Cause currently you know, currently a lot of what we're telling people is just based on the statistics of prior aftershock sequences. And the the range of behavior of prior aftershock sequences is pretty broad. So we're telling people, you know, you could get 10 aftershocks or you could get a thousand aftershocks, right? And so we want to be able to, to kind of narrow that down a bit and get people more kind of precise, but still accurate information. So I think that's what it's going to be. It's going to be the, kind of this winnowing down through time. Um, and, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that on a, you know, on a kind of 
10 ish year time scale that maybe we'll get that from a couple orders of magnitude to just one order of magnitude and feel good about that. And then maybe in another 10 years, we can get something smaller than that. I don't know. But yeah, it's not like, it's not like a kind of a single big goal that, that we're trying to get to. Whatever the timeline looks like, I wonder if you can walk me through, you know, the all important goal of minimizing damage to property, mitigating loss of life. What does it look like when these systems, when the science is mature? What will that mean when an earthquake happens? So I think for the aftershock forecast, what that means is that there's that there's enough, that there's kind of, the information is accurate and precise enough that people can make decisions about, should I be in this building or not? And if I shouldn't be in this building, when can I come back? There's going to be decisions about, you know, should we close this bridge? When should we reopen it? There's going to be, um, you know, decisions about, we know that aftershocks are more likely in a particular location than others. So there's going to be decisions about where are we going to position fire trucks? Where are we going to position ambulances? Where are we going to, per- where are we going to put the Red Cross shelter? You know, that, that sort of decision, um, is I think the sort of decision that we can support with an aftershock forecast that can impact, um, you know, response and recovery and resilience of a community um, that's just experienced this big, this big earthquake. Thinking so about think, buildings and, and bridges, to what extent does this work get you involved in the whole world of earthquake engineering? Um, so I don't, I don't interact with that, that world very much. Um, And, you know, and I think this is actually kind of a a problem for seismology in general, that there is this, I think, a kind of a big culture gap, actually, between the seismologists and, um, you know, the civil engineers. And I think people have been working on kind of bridging that that gap. And, you know, certainly USGS has some engineers and, and some kind of engineering seismology people who bridge that gap. And Southern California Earthquake Center has been doing a pretty good job, too, in trying to trying to bridge that gap. But I think that's a that's a really important gap that, you know, we need to kind of keep working to really, really bridge. But yeah, I don't I don't personally interact with a lot of engineers. Gene, besides the survey itself, what are the scientific societies that are most important for your research from the AGU, the Seismological Society? What's most important to you beyond the survey? Yeah, I think you know, certainly AGU and SSA and um, the Southern California Earthquake Center have have been, uh, all of those have been really important. Um, um, and I think that then there's uh, some more international meetings. There's an international statistical seismology meeting that happens every two years. That's, um, that's another really, really kind of important important meeting internationally are there government are there seismological or geophysical government agencies that you interface with in other words is there the 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 usgs Um, of mexico or france or what have you yeah yeah i mean most countries have kind of a, a a similar agency and we do um you know we do with with forecasting, you know, it, it's usually kind of considered bad form to forecast earthquakes in other people's countries. So <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> we, 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 we don't do, we don't do much of that unless we're, you know, requested um, by a country or, you know, if there's part of an international response to a, a big earthquake, sometimes we'll do that. But um, it's more of that we interact with our counterparts in in different countries who are also working to implement the same sort of forecast that in their country that we're working on in the u.s um so yeah so there's there's certainly yeah there's a there's a community there of of scientists there's um particularly people in uh new zealand and italy um are two countries that are both you know i would say with us or ahead of us in terms of, of the aftershock forecasting um so yeah, so we have some really really important uh, uh, interactions with colleagues in those countries. And... Jean, if you'll indulge me, in two years, major awards for you: the Richter Award in 2006, the McElwain Award in 2007. What were you doing that was resonating so strongly that was recognized mm-hmm. as 
so important in the field at that time? Um, so, so some, you know, so, so I've been working on aftershock triggering for a while, and I think, um, you know, I had a, a paper in grad school that, that um, is one of those papers that's still kind of cited a lot about aftershock forecasting. Um, <clears throat> and I've also been working on trying to understand the level of stress in the crust, um, which is a really hard thing to measure. To measure directly, you have to drill one of these multi-million dollar boreholes. And, and, um, and so I've been developing some methods to try to pull out information about stress from the earthquake information that we already have. And, and I think that work you know, that was also work I started at Caltech. And I think that work's been kind of controversial that, you know, if you have a, a sample of rock in a lab and you measure how strong it is, it has a certain strength. And when I've gone and done studies of what I think that the, the strength of real rock in the real Earth's crust is, it comes out of about an order of magnitude lower than that. And that was pretty controversial at first, I think. Um, but I think it really got people talking about this, talking about, you know, how do we really measure this in the real earth? Um, can we just extrapolate these, these lab measurements that, you know, we don't understand a lot of other conditions in the real earth that affect this, like fluid pressure. Um, and so I think, so I think that work really kind of got, got people thinking and talking, even if a lot of them, you know, got there from being very skeptical of my results. Um, and I think, I think in the end, a lot of people have, have repeated what I've done for different earthquakes, different data sets, stuff like that, and, and gotten fairly similar results of sort of low stress uh, in the crust that I did. So I think, you know, I think that that kind of made made a bit of a splash in the field. And I think I think got me got me noticed as an early career scientist. Gene, generally, if you can talk about locality versus extrapolation, where your research is really focused on a particular time and place and when it can be generalized to understand what happens at a planetary level. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to do work that's, that's general. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, we, we have the earthquakes we have, right? I mean, you can't design an experiment, right? You have, <laughs> you have the earthquakes that, that you've had. So, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, so I mean, I, I, I try and hope that the stuff I'm doing is, you know, relevant outside of the, the locations where I work. I, I use a lot of data from California because we have great data here, right? And, you know, especially including all that data from, from the Southern California network that, that USGS and Caltech run together. Um, so, so, you know, California, California is a great place to work because we have earthquakes, we have a lot of data. Um, there's, there's also, you know, really fantastic data in Japan and fortunately, uh, seismology is a, a field where people are, are very open about data sharing and, you know, there's tons of, there's tons of data just out there on the web that you can download from, you know, Japan and, and other countries. So, so there's just fantastic amounts of data to, to work with in various places. And so. So I think myself and a lot of other people do tend to work a lot in, in those locations, but certainly the hope is that what we weren't learn working in those locations is relevant elsewhere. That if we look, look in the subduction zone in Japan in detail, that that's also relevant to processes in subduction zones in other places in the world. Well, Jane, let's now go back prior to your time at Caltech. When you were at Cornell as an undergrad, was seismology and geophysics, was that on your radar at all? Was that what you wanted to pursue afterwards? <clears throat> no, no. So, so I'm, I'm going to take my history back actually a little bit before Cornell to kind of explain how I ended up <laughs> at Caltech and seismology. Um, so, so I grew up in Bishop, California. Do you know, are you familiar with no. Bishop? Um, do you do you know where the the Caltech Owens Valley Radio Observatory? Sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So up on the eastern side of the Sierras. Okay, so um, my dad worked there as a, a member of professional staff. Oh wow. Yeah, yeah. So he was a Caltech employee. Um, what years was he we, there? 
So he was there from probably about 1907. So he worked on campus, I think, maybe from 70 to 72. And then he worked up at, at the Owens Valley Radio Observatory. I think he retired probably around 2000, something like that. What was his area? What did he work on? <laughs> so so he he's both an astronomer and a um, electrical engineer. So he did um, design and maintenance and upkeep of a lot of their electrical equipment. So he, you know, they, they have people coming through to observe all the time, um, but, he, but he was a permanent staff member there who was um, basically, you know, designing and implementing their equipment, helping people who are observing troubleshoot with the equipment and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, so, so that's out in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> specifically out in the middle of nowhere, so there's no, not much radio interference. Um, yeah, so, so that's where I, I grew up. I, I grew up up there. Um, so I grew up, you know, first of all, with a familiarity with Caltech, because um, my dad worked for Caltech. You know, as a family, we would um, drive down to Pasadena maybe twice a year uh, to visit people on campus. So, you know, as a small child, I, I hung around in the, you know, in the lily ponds looking for turtles and stuff. So, so I have a I have kind of a fondness for, for the Caltech campus going back a long time. Um, but in any case, the, the Owens Valley is, you know, a very kind of seismically and volcanologically active area. Um, there's been, you know, I, I experienced a number of pretty sizable earthquakes while I lived there. Um, the Mammoth Mountain volcano goes through these, you know, is it going to erupt? Is it not going to erupt? And there's, you know, so, um, and there's, you know, pretty recent, you know, there's evidence of pretty recent eruptions, I think even like 300, 400 years ago or something in that area. So, so there's really tons of like very geologically and geophysically interesting stuff up there. And so I grew up kind of interested in the stuff, but also at the same time having no idea that you could like make a career out of it. <laughs> and, you know, so I went to I went to college thinking I was going to do a, you know, a, a real kind of make a career out of it thing. And I was going to major in computer science because, you know, it's clear that the computer industry is going places and I want to be part of that. And that's going to be a good career. And, I, you know, I, I that that's what I was thinking when I was at Cornell was was kind of focused on a you know, a career in, in, uh, computer science. Um, yeah, so that's, that, that's kind of how I arrived at, at Cornell and, and, you know, it took me, it took me a while at Cornell to, to even find that a geology department is a thing and I can go over there and I can take some classes and this is actually a lot more interesting than computer science. And, um, so yeah, it, 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 I didn't realize I was interested in earth science kind of early enough to change majors. So I, you know, I went through and I finished, um, you know, I finished a computer science major and I even sort of tried to work at a, a tech startup for a year. And then uh, that just wasn't working for me. And it's not really what I wanted to do. And I wanted to see if I could just change course and, and do geoscience. Did you do any geoscience at Cornell? Yeah, yeah, I did. I, I, I took, I took some classes. Um, yeah, I, you know, so I did take a geophysics class. Uh, I don't know, structural geology class, like some intro, maybe mineralogy, and and yeah. So I took, I took probably, I don't, I don't even know, like maybe five or six. Maybe not that many, maybe three or four geoscience classes while I was at Cornell, and they were great. I, you know, it was it was really, yeah, it was really fascinating stuff, and yeah, it just it just completely sucked me in, and you know, and it, it had that kind of resonance too with you know where I had grown up and and being interested in in you know the earthquakes and volcanoes and stuff around where I grew up and it. It all just sort of was really interested and really resonated, and I wanted to do that. Right? <laughs> now, was Caltech the be-all and end-all for graduate school? Did you apply more widely? Would you have gone anywhere? Um, I mean, Caltech was my top choice, and you know, 
once I'd kind of, particularly once I'd really decided I wanted to do seismology, like, you know, the Caltech Seismolab, you know, is the, you know, in my view, really the top place to do seismology. So that is where I wanted to go. And, you know, I definitely applied for some other programs. There's definitely some other great seismology programs out there. And I would have gone to, you know, any number of other, you know, really good seismology programs. But yeah, I really wanted to go to, to Caltech and I really saw it as the, the top seismology program. And I was really amazed and excited that I got in. What, what was the game plan for you? How well formed were your ideas about the kind of research you would want to pursue in graduate school? Um, I think it maybe wasn't that well formed at that point. I, you know, I think I knew, I, I think at that point I was, you know, knowing that I didn't, that I wanted to do seismology was kind of where I was and I wanted to do, you know, studies of earthquakes rather than, because, you know, seismology is kind of two fields, right? One is trying to understand earthquakes and the other is using those earthquake waves to image the structure of the earth. And so I knew I was really interested in the, let's understand more about earthquakes and kind of the more I learned that we don't really understand all that much about earthquakes, the kind of the more drawn I was to, to try to understand more about earthquakes. Um, so I think that's kind of where I was that I knew, I knew I wanted to work on some projects to kind of try to better understand physically what's going on with earthquakes. Um, that, yeah. That, that wasn't a game plan at all. That was a general field of interest, yeah. Jean, coming in the early, mid-1990s, what was your sense once you got comfortable in the Seismolab? What were, what were the big debates? What were people working on? What was sort of the frontier of the field at that point? Um, so the, the kind of the, the frontier that I jumped in on was this um, stress-triggering business. Like that was, that was a fairly new field in the early 90s, um, a lot of it actually coming out of USGS here. Um, and, you know, there, there was definitely some, I, I felt some excitement about it, a uh, possibility of, of using it to forecast. There had just been the 1992 Landers earthquake, which was, um, you know, this big earthquake east of LA. And there was a lot of data, there was a lot of triggering from that earthquake. So it was kind of this type earthquake that people were using to develop these theories about, about triggering. Um, and I, you know, and not everybody believed it at that point. So I feel like, you know, I, I started working on this stuff and I did feel like, um, You know, you know, I did feel like I had to defend what I was working on, right? I mean, we always have to defend what we're working on, but that I, I really had to, I really had to defend um, what I was working on, um, and so I, I, I felt like that was, that was pretty exciting. Let's, let's see what, what else was going on, and there were definitely some some debates about various earthquake prediction methods, but I mean, everybody at Caltech just thought they were baloney. So I don't think there was a lot of debate within the people in Seismolab about that. Um, let's see, what, what, what else were people really excited about? Yeah, I think that there was also a lot of excitement, I think, about trying to understand the role of fluids in faulting. And, you know, you talk to Emily, she probably talked to you a lot about that. Her, her work was really, really pretty exciting. But I think there were some other other folks who were really excited about that kind of stuff. Um, let's see, what else were people, people excited about? Or, um, blanking a little bit here. Someone will come back to me. Jean, what was the process of determining who your thesis advisor would be? Um, 
when I was accepted Caltech, Ale Hoxton called me on the phone and asked me if I wanted to work for him, and I said yes. <laughs> so, That's how so it happened. It, as easy as that. It was. It was that easy. Yeah. Yeah. I knew. I knew that. Um, you know, Ale is. You know, he was in charge of the Southern California Seismic Network at the time, and also doing a lot of research, and you know. He and you know here Kanamori were really doing the sort of research I was I was interested in um, the most interested in and trying to understand physically what's going on with earthquakes and so you know when Ale called me up and asked if I wanted to work for him and um, you know we would set it up so here Kanamori was my co-advisor he was you know so here was also my advisor I was just, you know that that just sounded perfect so yes <laughs> and and it was decided that he's learning yeah. <laughs> Coming in with a computer science background, do you think part of you getting snapped up so quickly was that you had computational skills that could be immediately put to good use? No, I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know how much how much difference that that my degree made. Because um, I think you know some of the other grad students also had. You know, and it's not like everybody had a geophysics degree or a geology degree. Um, and I think a lot of the other grad students, even if they didn't have computer science degrees, I think had a lot of programming skills. So I don't know that I particularly stood out as somebody with, you know, a particular amount of programming skills. Um, yeah, so I, yeah. I, I think it was just sort of a match based on interest. You know, when you apply to grad school, you kind of write a, an essay about what you're interested in doing. And, and I think my interests really match Ale's interests. And so. Now, were Ale and Hiru, were they working together or was this sort of an, a separate advisee relationship? Um, <clears throat> so they, they definitely did work together. I, I, I don't think they have a lot of. Um, co-authored publications, but they definitely, you know, always struck me as sort of friendly people who work together. Um, and they kind of co-advised me on the same project. So it wasn't like I was doing one project with Ale and one project with you. They were sort of co-advising me on, on one project. So, so I would usually meet with, with each of them individually. I would meet with Ale, I don't know, weekly or something. And I would meet with Hero a little less frequently. Tell, um, tell me about Ale's project and how far along it was developed when you joined. Um, so, so he he kind of started working on on this business of trying to understand stress in the crust using um, lots of small earthquakes. So the basic idea is you have tons of small earthquakes, and each of those moved in response to stress. And maybe you can't get much information out of one of them, but with this whole big data set, you can say, you know, what was the stress that was driving all of these earthquakes? And so he had done, you know, some some work on that in kind of LA Basin, some of these earthquake areas, like where the Landers earthquake had occurred. And the idea was to to really just do kind of a big all of Southern California look at at the stress field. Um, so that, that's sort of how developed that was when I started. And I did end up doing that. We got sort of sidetracked in some other things that I think turned out to be more, more interesting. Um, but that was kind of the, the big picture idea. And, <clears throat> you know, and that sounded, that sounded interesting to me. Um, Ale also had another grad student working with him, um, Julie Norris, who got kind of started on the aftershock triggering and you know that interested me too so they kind of pulled me in on on that project as well so that's kind of how i got how i got interested in the, the aftershock triggering um what were some of the goals of the project we talked earlier about you know the long-term hopes of where this science might take us how early on in the process how provisional was the research conceptualized at that point yeah i mean it, it it's pretty basic research it's um you know stress in the crust is what's driving earthquakes so if we don't <laughs> if we don't know what that stress is how do we ever build any more models on on top of that so you know it's meant to be kind of this very basic foundational 
piece of information that any kind of physical model of earthquake generation should need to know what the stress field is. So, you know, that that's kind of the the you know, it's 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 very basic, not not very applied at all. Um, but I I think was but with trained I think is a pretty good PhD project because all the data is there. The methodology's been developed. Ale had already done, you know, kind of some of these smaller scale areas. He had already studied some of these smaller scale areas. So it was, you know, it was a good project then. It was something that was, you know, clearly doable, would have a clear result, and that result would be useful for other people. So yeah, so it, so I think it was a it was a, a, a pretty well thought out project. Gene, did any of this involve field work or was all data coming into the lab? Yeah, no, I didn't do any field work at all. This was all this was all based on the Southern California Seismic Network data. So what were some of the technical challenges in making sense of the data? The technical challenges. So I I feel like, yeah, the challenges weren't weren't so much kind of technical as conceptual, I think. Um, <clears throat> so one, one of the, the things that was sort of, I think, most interesting about understanding stress is trying to understand the stress that's projected onto individual faults like the San Andreas Fault. So I think for me, I was like, okay, yeah, I'm going to make a big map of California, that, of Southern California that's going to have the stress. But what I really want to know is what is the stress on the San Andreas? So how conceptually do I go from, I'm just going to, you know, make this big map to how am I really going to understand what's the stress right there on, on, on the San Andreas? And I think that, that was, I think, the best paper that came out of everything, you know, we did for my thesis was kind of turning it around and saying, we're going to do this as a very fault base thing. We're going to look at the San Andreas. What's the, what's the stress right at the San Andreas? How does the stress change as you go right away from the San Andreas? And we actually found that the stress does change. Um, there's sort of a, a big regional stress field for Southern California, but as you get into the San Andreas fault, that stress changes, it rotates to, um, put more stress on the San Andreas than, than you would have thought if you looked at the, the kind of the far field stress. So I think that, you know, not, not so much a technological challenge, but just like the challenge of what's the right way to think about this data and kind of deciding that maybe the right way to think about this data is to think about what's important. The San Andreas fault is important. So let's think about this from the point of view of the San Andreas fault. Now, the work that you were doing with Hiru, was that related at all or that was separate? Yeah, it, it, he was he was kind of he was advising me on the same project. I was getting advice from both AL and Hiru on that same project. Where was there overlap in their advice and where were their differences just, you know, based on their own areas of expertise? I, I, I don't think there were, you know, I think they both just had, had ideas like, try this, try that, try this. So, you know, I talk to one of them and I come back to my office with a big list of things to try and I go talk to the other and I come back with another big list of things to try. Um, so, yeah, so I think it was great. It was very, I think, complimentary to get, you know, these twice as many things to try. <laughs> so, what worked ultimately? Um, when did you know you had enough to complete the project? Oh gosh, um, I think when I really when I when I discovered that there really was a signature of the San Andreas fault there in the in the stress data, that just you know that felt to me like yeah I actually discovered something and you know we actually got it published in Science so you know it it did feel like you know we had really discovered something and that that's I think the point that made me feel like yeah this is <clears throat> this is a good project we you know we discovered something. Um, yeah, maybe, you know, maybe I can actually do science because, you know, I, I had kind of, you know, obviously with help from, from Ale and here, but, you know, I had kind of been the one driving this, let's look at this from a San Andreas based perspective. And, um, so I, I felt, 
you know, that's, I think, the point where I felt like, yeah, I can do this research stuff. Like, I came up with, you know, with, with an idea. I figured out how to implement it. I got a result out of it. That result was actually interesting enough that, you know, people were interested, got it published in science. A lot of people argued with me, got a lot of people's interest. So that's, I think, where I got, you know, pulled in feeling like, yeah, I I, I did something here that, that people are interested in. I can do this. This was a good thesis project. Um, <clears throat> so... Gene, more of a social and cultural question to historicize the atmosphere of the Seismolab in the 1990s. So, of course, decades earlier, the Seismolab was definitely a boys club. Did that feel like ancient history when you were a graduate student or were there still vestiges of that? Um, <clears throat> so I, I don't recall like a feel, any sort of like boys club feeling there was definitely there were there was only one female professor joanne stock um so you know there's definitely <clears throat> you know definitely women were underrepresented and um you know it was very white also so you know there were definitely definitely um you know vestiges of of uh <clears throat> the days when it would have been all white men and hero, I guess. But <laughs> now the underrepresentation um, <laughs> was that true for graduate students as well? Who else was there? There's you, Emily. Any other women graduate students at that point? Yeah, yeah. So there were quite a few actually. Um, yeah, it was maybe about a third women, I think. So so within the grad students, it was it was pretty comfortable. Like there were quite a few women, and I think that. I think that helped with sort of the atmosphere mm -hmm. of being a sort of a more inclusive atmosphere. But certainly then when we looked at the professors and we saw, you know, only Joanne, you know, it was clear that, you know, it was quit <laughs> it was clear that there was still a problem. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I don't know how, there's definitely more female faculty now in the uh, division, absolutely. but I don't. Yeah. I don't know what what fraction it's up to at this point. Better, um, it's better. Better, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Things are getting better. <laughs> things are definitely getting better. Yeah, yeah. There, but there there were other weird things like the grad students all had our offices on the third third floor in South Mud. So that third floor just had um, faculty and grad student offices. And I guess when they built the building, they didn't think there would be any women up there. So there was no women's room. There was only a men's room. Yeah. And basically every time I had to use the women's room, I had to go downstairs to the second floor. That's the, you know, there's one there near the admin office where I guess they thought the women would be and, you know, truck back upstairs. But um, I came back a couple of years after I graduated and they'd actually changed that into a women's room. So now that's progress. It is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Gene, it's going to sound like a long time ago also, but tell me about computers and the internet when you were in graduate school? What seemed really primitive in retrospect? What seemed cutting edge at the time? Um, gosh, it, 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 my first maybe three years or something, I didn't have my own computer. I mean, that that seems really primitive now, right? Like I, I have four computers in this office right now, right? <laughs> so compared to that, um, so, yeah, so we had, you know, we had a student computer lab and it was kind of first come, first serve. And there were kind of not quite enough computers. And those first couple of years, I ended up working like sometimes I would work like all night because that's when computers would be available. Um, and so it was really fantastic when maybe my fourth year or something like that we you know we put in a proposal one available proposal included a computer for me and we got it and I had my own computer on my desk that was a fantastic day so yeah so it was pretty primitive <laughs> and then what about the databases the way that you would access the data was anything analog still at that point um so the the data I was using was all digital from the network it was 
Um, I think the network was probably pretty cutting edge for its time. Um, that they had a lot of data and it was pretty easy to access. They, you know, wrote their own little codes that you could use to, to access their data that worked pretty well. Um, yeah, so, so that was, that was pretty good. There, there, there was still a lot of everything before the eighties, I think was analog. And I, I didn't use that data, but other people did. And I knew, know that some of the grad students had to go through this thing of like hand scanning these old paper records and, and stuff that just, <laughs> that didn't seem appealing, but, but yeah, I mean, um, yeah. And there's the, the internet was, I think pretty difficult at that time too. It, you know, there were certainly search engines, but there wasn't, I, you know, I don't think there were any very good search engines, you know, for scholarly articles. There wasn't anything like, you know, Google scholar that we have now where you can just, you know, find, um, find articles. So yes, yeah, so we would have to go the library. And I think the library computer had, had a system where you could search for articles on various topics and it was like really really slow so i remember spending long times just sitting in front of this terminal at the library um you know trying to find papers on on some subject um so so i think that was kind of slow and i think also one of the really fantastic things that's happened with the internet is um when you know when you're trying to research a subject you find a paper that you're interested in, they have a reference list, right? And that, that gives you a clue of where to go. Then you find the references, you find those papers, you look at their references, you find those papers. So you can go back backwards in time really well when you found a paper that's interesting, but you can't go forwards in time from that paper. And now we have, you know, with Google Scholar and stuff, now you can go forwards in time. You say, oh, this is a great paper. Who cited this paper? And then you can find all those papers and you can go forward in time as well. And you know, so I think that sort of stuff, I think has been really fantastic for research. Um, Cause I think that was, that was one of the hardest things during grad school was kind of finding all of the literature that you needed to find. So, so yeah, the, the data was easier than, than the literature search, I guess. Gene, you've probably heard the same stories as me, you know, in the days of Frank Press and Benioff, that the Seismo Lab was this intellectual magnet where senior people would come and spend time and give talks and things like that. Do you recall that still being the case, that it was a, a place that people at other institutions wanted to visit or even needed to visit because of what was happening there? Yeah, it, um... It's certainly a lot of certainly a lot of visitors came through, and you know at the time I think I kind of thought that was normal that you have this kind of constant constant stream of visitors. Um, you know, nowhere else I've been since has had quite that constant stream of, of visitors. Um, so yeah, I think I think it was still seen as kind of a, a an important place. Um, another thing I, I I think to mention, you know, when you kind of talk about you know, kind of the high powered people coming through to talk. I, I think one of the great things about the Seismolab was the extent to which the grad students really got incorporated in all the conversations. Um, so people probably talk to you about coffee hour, right? Where, you know, twice a day, everybody goes into the coffee room and sits around and talks about science. And, um, you know, so you have like all of these really big name people there, right? You have, you know, you have here Ken and Murray, you have Don Anderson and, um, you know, all of these big name people sitting around talking and the grad students are just sitting around in a circle with them, you know, fully participating in the conversations. Um, you know, grad students bring their work to show off. Um, and sometimes somebody will ask you a grad student a question because you're the expert on, on something. Um, so, and, you know, and when there would be visitors, the visitors would participate in these coffee hours. And so you as a grad student got to, you know, interact and you kind of fully interact with these visitors at, at coffee hour and stuff. And so, um, 
Yeah, I, I, I think that was that was really, really a great aspect of of uh, the seismic lab was that coffee hour and kind of the 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 amount of interaction and how kind of non hierarchical it was. Mm -hmm. Just freely, I, free ideas flowing from one person to the next. Yeah, yeah. Jean, you mentioned um, the conceptual challenges of the project. So with that in mind, when did you know you were ready to present this, defend it as a complete project? Um, I, I guess I had to kind of defend, defend it a bunch of times. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so the yeah so the the way a lot of stuff would work there is that you know you'd be working on something you show it to your advisor then you take it to coffee hour and you show it to everybody at coffee hour and they would you know they would be very challenging kind of the the atmosphere at caltech is certainly that you know if you're going to say something you need to be ready to defend it um and so you know the professors and other grad students would would challenge you there at coffee hour and you'd start to understand maybe what are the things you haven't fully thought through what are the things you need to do to to better defend what you're trying to say um what are things that you tell somebody and they just don't even understand so you need to figure out how to go back and and explain that better and so so i think you I had a lot of opportunities to explain what I was doing at various stages, get a lot of feedback, get, you know, familiar with what the arguments against it were going to be. Um, and then you kind of take it out and you present it at a scientific meeting or, um, you know, you get invited to give a seminar at another institution. And then you have kind of another round of, of, maybe skepticism and questions and challenges and you kind of figure out how to respond to all of that. And I think kind of, yeah, once I have shown my work and defended it to various audiences and kind of understood what are all of the, what are all the kind of possible challenges here? What are all of the, um, you know, what are all of the weaknesses and, and how do I fix those weaknesses? And, once, yeah, you know, once I kind of felt I'd heard all that and I sort of fixed everything and I still had something that, you know, worked and I still had a good result and it stood up to kind of all of the challenges that, that people had thought of, then I'm like, yeah, okay, this is, this is solid, this is done. You mentioned before that this research was really fundamental. You were not thinking yet about <laughs> societal applications, mitigating risk and things like that. How, looking back, would you translate that fundamental work to getting closer to something that actually helps people in, the, in an earthquake situation? Yeah, so <clears throat> um, I think where, where I hope that that sort of information about stress gets used is in um, physical models of earthquake interaction and physical models of earthquake rupture. And those are both, those are both developing fields as well. And um, I think it's been kind of a challenge to get people working in those fields to use the stress information that we have from observations that, um, modeling of the dynamics of an earthquake rupture seems to have a lot of kind of difficulties, a lot of choices that have to be made, a lot of assumptions. And it seems to be, you know, kind, kind of difficult to just, you know, have somebody hand you a data set and you just swap out what you were using and swap something back in and expect it to still all work. <laughs> So I think there's been, you know, a little bit of um, hesitation on the part of the people who do that dynamic rupture modeling to really use the information that that we have about stress. And, um, you know, I I'm close colleagues with some people who do that kind of work, and we talk about it. And um, they want to 
they want to incorporate this information, but it's maybe their modeling isn't quite to the point where they can, that, you know, their modeling needs them to have kind of a constant stress state. And when I tell them, no, the stress state varies a lot, maybe that doesn't work anymore. Um, they need to have a particular stress state even to propagate the rupture. And maybe the stress state, I'm telling them, no, this is the real stress in the earth, as far as we can tell, that a rupture doesn't even propagate, right? So there's still all these kind of mysteries and, and, and stuff. So, so it's not as straightforward as I think I had hoped that, you know, we could just hand off the stress information to people who are doing physical models and, and that would improve the model. So I think, I think there's kind of a long way to go in kind of both fields, both the determining the stress and taking that stress and using it in physical models. And I think we maybe need to be talking to each other more to make sure that we're actually giving them something they can actually use. Um, Jean, yeah, besides, so that's, your, you, besides your two advisors, who else was on your thesis committee? Oh my gosh. Uh, okay. Tom, Tom Heaton. Um, he's very, very interested in stress. He has a lot of um, ideas. We, we, We've had some disagreements, um, but but he's a he's a good guy. He was a lot of fun to have on the committee. Um, Joanne Stock was on my committee, and there must have been one other person, right? Uh, Mike Gernis. Mike Gernis was on my committee. Anything memorable from the oral defense? Any discussions <laughs> or questions? <laughs> so, um, no, know, knowing that group of people, I went in with the feeling that if I could get them talking amongst themselves, I could just stand there and let that happen. And that definitely did happen a few times that, um, you know, they asked me questions and, and then they felt like they needed to respond to each other's questions. And I could kind of just stand there and listen to this discussion for a while. So, so that was, that was kind of fun and interesting. Yeah. They were, everybody was very engaged. Um, Everybody was very engaged. Uh, it was, yeah, it was, it went well. Um, they didn't leave me out in the hall too long afterwards. <laughs> what would you say, you know, in that moment when you really have to, to summarize your thesis, what your principal conclusions or contributions were at that point? Um, I think my principal contribution was um, saying that it looked to me like the, the level of stress in Southern California was much lower than people had thought based on lab experiments, and that the San Andreas was not as unusual of a fault as people seemed to think at the time. Um, so I think those were those were kind of the big the big takeaways at the time. Now, even before you defended, just a question on the timing: Was your postdoc at Scripps? already in place at that point? Yeah, yeah, I think I went pretty quickly between um, the defense and, and moving to San Diego. Um, yeah, so I think I I defended it some, I defended in 2000, but I think I it was in the summer, I guess I had just missed the, the graduation, so I graduated the next year, like I marched in, 2001, even though I had kind of finished at Caltech in 2000 and defended in 2000 and moved to Scripps. Tell me about Scripps. Why was that attractive to you for your postdoc? Um, two things. Uh, one was to work with Peter Shearer, who is just an all around really smart guy. Um, and the other is I was in an office with a view of the beach. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty um, good yeah 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 no i i uh, really liked san diego i thought it would be a great place to live for a while um i learned a lot working with peter um he does he does kind of both earthquake seismology and more sort of global earth structure seismology so uh while i was there his other postdocs and students were mostly working on these sort of global seismology projects and I didn't work on a global seismology project, but I was there in enough kind of meetings with them and talking to them about their projects and stuff that I learned a lot more about global seismology than, than I had known before that. So, um, 
institutionally, what were some of the things that were really different that were happening at Scripps compared to just coming from Caltech? Um, Scripps was, I, I, I think it, it's separate from, it's physically separate from most of UC San Diego. And it felt more like a kind of an independent research institution than, you know, Caltech, the Seismo Lab always felt like part of a bigger campus. And um, it seemed like there'd be more kind of interaction with, you know, people from the physics and engineering departments and stuff. Whereas at, <clears throat> at Scripps, it was, you know, it was kind of, it's, it's this, you know, like, like there were no undergrad students. I mean, not like there's tons of undergrad students at Caltech, but there were like no undergrad students there. Um, I didn't feel like we had a lot of interaction with, with um, the rest of campus. It, yeah, it felt like, like kind of its own, own kind of a little isolated research institution. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it was, um, yeah, it kind of, I think, maybe culturally it had a little bit more of of the kind of the top down here's a professor and all the people who work for them whereas i i always felt like seismolab had a very kind of flat feel to it that you know like all the grad students would be working with different professors but we would still all get together a lot and um we would all we would get together for everybody to practice their thesis defense so you like you know got to to help somebody prep for their thesis defense, you know, that works for different professors and stuff. Whereas I feel like at Scripps, it did get kind of like, you know, more like I'm in Peter Shearer's group and here are the other people in, in Peter Shearer's group. And I, I, I think I knew less about what was going on with some of the other professors and the postdocs that, that worked for them. What was Peter's main research at that point? <clears throat> so he was, you know, he was just getting into kind of, he's done a lot of global seismology and he was just getting into kind of regional seismology of, of Southern California. So he was working a lot on improving ways to locate earthquakes. Um, and this is something that happened with, you know, having more digital data and um, having more computer power and stuff to come up with. He was coming up with these ways to take, you know, all of Southern California and, um, every earthquake that had happened in Southern California in the last 40 years and, and figure, you know, relocating each of those earthquakes uh, and, and observing those structures and stuff. So, um, yeah, so he was, he was, uh, yeah, he was doing a lot of that. And um, yeah, he and I were working on focal mechanisms, which is the orientation of slip of the earthquakes and you know, and what he wanted, he wanted to do that in that kind of big, big data kind of way too, that he wanted to take all of, all of Southern California and, and process all of it to get focal mechanisms. So in the end of that project, we had um, locations and focal mechanisms for, I, I don't know how many tens of thousands of earthquakes in Southern California. Um, what aspects of your research at Scripps would you say is a, uh an extrapolation or an extension of what you were doing at Caltech and what was brand new? I think a lot, a lot of it was new. A lot of it was kind of a, a step backwards because um, when I was doing my research at Caltech, a lot of it was using the focal mechanisms and the focal mechanisms were determined um, y using a, a method that had been around for a while. Um, and while I was doing my thesis work, sometimes I would look at some of these mechanisms and kind of question their quality. And um, so with Peter, what we wanted to do was we wanted to go back and you know, say that, you know, these mechanisms are really important basic data that a lot of stuff is built on, not just the stress stuff, but a lot of trying to understand seismic tectonics is built on um, these focal mechanisms. And, you know, how reliable are they and can we do a better job at it? So that's basically what, what we were doing while I was at Scripps was um, in coming up with a new method for uh, estimating the focal mechanisms that um, did a lot better quality control 
than prior prior methods and then kind of chugging through all of the data of Southern California using that using that method. And um, you know, our method a lot of people are using now, it's the default that Southern California Seismic Network puts out mechanisms and they're using our our uh, our new method for that. So I think that postdoc we ended up having a lot bigger impact on kind of the basic data that goes into a lot of stuff. Gene, when it was time to enter the job market, was the survey like, was it really where you wanted to be? Were there other opportunities you were considering? What what did that look like at the time? Um, I, I did really want to work at the survey. I think um, when I was doing my work at, at Caltech on, and particularly on stress triggering, a lot of the really important work in that field was going on at the USGS. Mm -hmm. And um, so that really put USGS on my radar as, as a good place to do research. Would you go across um, the street? I mean, did you have interface with USGS while you were at the Seismo Lab? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, a lot of the USGS people would come across to, to go to coffee hour and seminars and stuff. Um, yeah, so most of the the stress triggering work was happening in the Menlo Park office um, up here in the in the Bay Area. And so that was kind of my one of my places where I really, really wanted to go was was the USGS in Menlo Park, which is you know where I went. Now we now we're in Moffett Field, but, but we're still at the Menlo Park office. So, so yeah, that was somewhere I was really excited about going. Um, I, I considered some faculty jobs, and I did apply for some faculty jobs. I, I think I was sort of afraid of spreading myself too thin in a faculty job, of having to do, you know, a good job at research and a good job at teaching. And um, yeah, so I felt like you know, pursuing a job where I could just focus on the research really felt good to me at the time. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I think if that hadn't, if it hadn't worked out at USGS, I, I, I think, you know, a university job would have, would have been fine. And I think I probably would have been fine, but you know, that was, that was kind of my fear at the time was, was the sort of fear of, of get, just getting spread too thin and not being able to, to do a good job of the research and, and the teaching. Gene, to round out our conversation, to bring up a point from earlier, talking about academic freedom, even as a junior scholar, when you joined the survey, was it true even then that you could essentially set your own agenda, do what you wanted to? So the first two years I was here, I was, I was a postdoc and um, this was through the Mendenhall postdoc program. And I basically wrote a proposal for this is the work I would do for those two years. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, you know, at that point I, I did what I proposed, but you know, I'm the, I'm the one who proposed that work. Um, yeah. And then, and then when I was hired, um, yeah, I, I, I feel like I've ever since then had, you know, a lot of freedom to, to pursue what, I feel is interesting and useful and, um, you know, I certainly, I certainly talk to my supervisors and others about directions and, you know, I do spend a certain amount of my time working on kind of applied stuff, uh, for this aftershock forecast product. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, I feel like, I have had a lot of a lot of freedom here to to pursue what I want. Gene, have you and kept up with the Seismo Lab over the past two decades? Are you following what's going on? You know, I haven't really. Um, yeah, I uh, yeah, I've not really not really followed a lot. Um, yeah, I, I went back. I think a few years. Maybe a few years after I came to the survey, I went back and, and gave a talk, but I, I haven't been back there since, I don't know, probably 2006, something like that. So. Well, maybe there's a centennial observance that could change that finally. Yeah, that would, that would be great. It would be great to go back. Yeah, yeah. Gene, a few last questions to round out our conversation. What has stayed with you ever since that you learned at the Seismo Lab? 
collaboration, analysis of the data, being able to identify the most important problems to work on, those kinds of things. Yeah, yeah. So I think I think it's been that kind of how to identify problems to work on. And so I think there's kind of two things. One, one is this, I, I think kind of feeling like, like if you can be the first person to have an idea and do it and measure it and you, you know, you don't have to be perfect, but if you can be first, you're making a big impact. Like if there's something new to measure and you figure out a way to measure it and you say it's 10, right. And then other people come by later and they're like, actually, maybe it's 9.73, whatever, whatever. Right. I mean, that, that initial thing of like, here's a thing it's worth measuring. I measured it. This is what I got is a really important, impactful thing to do. And it's kind of more maybe big picture important than the kind of chiseling around the edges of that, deciding if it's really 9.9 .9 instead of 10 or whatever. Um, and so I think that's, that's kind of a thing I, I learned at, at Caltech because I think that's, what a lot of the professors kind of did and a, a lot of what they kind of encouraged grad students to do was kind of jump after those new things and maybe it doesn't have to be perfect but it's really important to just jump after that new thing um and then the other the other thing that i really took to heart about choosing projects is um one time in coffee don anderson told us that richard feynman had told him <laughs> that the way to figure out the importance of the way to, to figure out like kind of the value of a of a project was the importance of the thing multiplied by how much you can actually do about it and <laughs> if it's super important but you can't do anything about it don't bother with and if you can do a ton about it but maybe it's not so important don't bother with that either find something that you know it's important and you really actually have a thing you can do about it. And so I think that's been like something that really, really has stuck in my mind. Gene, on that point, if you look at your contributions so far, where are they more on the fundamental research side and where are they more about translating them to societal benefit? Um, so I think my, my real impacts have been, um, Yeah, I think I think my my impacts, my societal impacts, I think have not been actually particularly great research. That's not quite the way to say it, but yeah, the the places where I've had societal impacts are not things where I'm like particularly proud that I think this was really groundbreaking research. Um, you know that we're implementing this aftershock forecasting. You know, it's based on models from the '80s. I'll be honest about that. It's based on models in the eighties. And the other kind of big societal impact that I had is I found a fault next to a nuclear power plant. Wow. <laughs> and that's, that's pretty good. <laughs> and that obviously has huge societal impact, right? But the work itself was kind of turned the crank. It was kind of, you know, here's an area. Let's get a better idea of where all the earthquakes are. Um, kind of turning the crank is, is just sort of making that initial data set of, of earthquakes. And then you notice that some of the earthquakes line up and yeah, it's a fault and it's next to a nuclear power plant. Um, but, but yeah, so I feel like, so I feel like I've had some of those impacts that are, you know, this, the societal impacts, but, you know, but, but weren't really kind of real scientific breakthroughs. Um, like that fault would have been of no interest to anybody if there hadn't been some critical infrastructure next to it. Um, but I think, I think where I've made impacts with research has really been with kind of pushing, pushing people's ideas about what's, what is, what's the stress in the crust, pushing people's ideas that, that maybe everything's, the crust is a lot weaker than we thought. Um, you know, kind of pushing people's ideas about um, what's the stress on the San Andreas fault. And I think, I think that's where I've had kind of 
kind of the most impact. And I think, again, those are things where it's been kind of new things, kind of leap for it. And, you know, and I don't, I don't think there's really a consensus yet of whether, you know, I, obviously I think I was right, but, you know, there's not necessarily a consensus that I was necessarily right about that, but I think I really kind of, kind of pushed through a, a kind of a new boundary of research and a lot of people followed and there was new research and new thinking. And I think that's, that's the stuff I'm most proud of from, you know, a, a research perspective. Finally, Jean, looking to the future, both in terms of what you want to study and where you want to do it, do you think you're a lifer both in terms of continuing on with Aftershocks and doing it at the survey? Um, I don't I don't have any particular desire to, to leave the survey, so I, I I would I would be happy to be a, a survey lifer. Um, yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I feel like um, I feel like the aftershocks, the aftershocks are important and I'm going to keep at it for a while, but, um, probably not a lifer on that. Um, is that because you think that the research will achieve some level of finality at some point or just you'll want to move on to other things that interest you at that point? Yeah, I think, I, I think it's good to kind of find different interests and and try different things after a while i i uh, i i also suspect you know this this you know how important is it versus what what can you do about it problem i you know at some point i'm probably going to hit the end of what i have to you know what can i do about the aftershock problem and then it's going to be time to find something else yeah. When will you know when you find it? What will you be looking for? <laughs> I don't know. I'll probably go to a talk at a meeting and go, oh, my gosh, what about this? Yeah. And then <laughs> so, so it'll be hard. It'll be hard to know until it hits me. That's great. Yeah. Jean, this has been a great conversation. I want to thank you so much for spending this time with me. Yeah, sure.